Hello, and welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, and joining me today is Greg Uttinger, uh, our usual regular uh, and most of the time host, which I'm filling in for. Emily Maxson is not in because she has just brought a new life into the world, one Gretchen Maxson. So congratulations to her. <laughs> And uh, moving on to to the discussion of the podcast, we're talking about the Davidic Covenant. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? Well, we've seen over the last several podcasts the Mosaic Covenant unraveling. The Ark is separated from the tabernacle. The Israel's uh, bandage on the situation, a new king, has not worked so well. The priests... Uh, apostatized by and large, and most of the rest of them were slaughtered. Uh, things have not been going well, and it looks like God's plans for Israel are going down the drain. And then David comes along. God anoints David by his servant Samuel. David is on the run for many years, fleeing Saul, who's very jealous and vindictive. Saul dies, and David comes to the throne of Judah, and then eventually to the throne of Israel. And we saw last time that he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, with the idea of stabilizing and centralizing and combining the kingdom and the monarch, the God's kingdom, God's theocracy, and the monarchy. He knows he is not an absolute king, but he is has some kind of relationship with God in that God has anointed him. He's a Messiah of some sort. But God hasn't specified exactly what that means yet, although David may have some suspicions. But he, having defeated many of his enemies and having established some sort of peace, he thinks the the, the ark is in a tent. I'm in a palace. This is not the way things ought to be. I'm going to build God a palace. He calls Nathan the prophet and says, I'm going to build God a palace. And Nathan says, thumbs up, good job, go for it. And no sooner does Nathan get home and God says, whoa, uh, red flag in the field. We didn't, I didn't say anything about that. So you go back and tell him, good intentions. You're not the one. And this is 2 Samuel 7. There's a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 17. Some of the language switches just a little bit. But the basic, God's rationale for not letting David do it is you're a man of blood. This is the task for a man of peace. So it was good that it was in your heart to do this, but it won't be you who builds me a house. It will be your son. And there's Mm. some heavy typology going on here. And so God just goes ahead and plays down his card and says, look, let's talk talk typology. Let's talk covenant. Uh, You wanted to make me a house. Nice. No, Uh, I'm going to make you a house, a dynasty, a family that's going to endure forever. And that's the key word in all of this. Keep, well, first, let's, let's look at what God actually says here. He says, uh, and this is verse 11 of chapter 7. And it's since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rods of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And thy throne shall be established forever. And David is shocked, put into awe, taken aback, and goes back in, in, into the tabernacle that he's established for the ark and sits down and praises God for all this. How, what am I, how am I supposed to respond to this? This is just incredible. Your mercy is great, and so on. Uh, o Lord, thou art that God. Thy words be true. Thou hast promised this goodness to thy servant. O Lord God, thou hast spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. The things that are key here, uh, I, I think, are, well, first of all, your seed from your bowels. So seed, we've seen seed before. Seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, seed of Isaac and Jacob. So that's 
that immediately should stir up, wait, this is the same seed. This is the same promise, deliverer, savior, hero that God's been talking about. We knew he would come through the line of Judah. The fact that David's anointed suggests that David will be the ancestor, but now we're nailing it down. David indeed will be the ancestor of this Messiah, this anointed king who's coming. Secondly, he will be, God, God adopts him as his son. I will be his father, he shall be my son. Now, that can bear a couple meanings. Solomon will be God's adopted son, but there's a point, this points beyond that to someone else, and that will become clear as we go along. Yeah. He, the, the words is we, kingdom, he's going to be a king, but the words, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Uh, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. It's an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting reign. It's an extension of what has begun here in David, but it's going on forever. And then lastly, and in connection with that, with that he, a little ambiguous, will build my house, because this is where this started. The, notice the, the one thing that we don't get here is the word covenant. It doesn't show up here. It'll show up later. But that is, in essence, what we have here. God is swearing that he is going to do these things for David. Now, let me, let me pull back for a second and uh, speak as a child of the 70s and, and cast this into what I think is a necessary light so that we can understand how important this is and how important the words forever really are. Mm. Well, actually, as a child of the 70s, I was le reading theology books written in the 40s and 50s because... They were relatively modern. Nobody wrote theology books. And uh, one of the great arguments between Reformed Christians and, and broader evangelicals, fundamentalists, was over the doctrines uh, called dispensationalism, the idea that God deals with people in history in rather airtight compartments where in each dispensation, economy, whatever you want to call it, God is dealing with a different principle of obedience or a different condition for blessing or something. The Jews were under law. Since Moses, with David, we have this promise of kingdom, the church is under grace, and so on. And one of the, the distinguishing marks of dispensationalism was the insistence that God had promised David a political kingdom over Israel, Canaan, and ultimately the whole world, and that this, this throne was in a Jewish throne. It was the throne of David over Judah and Israel. And until Messiah came and sat on such a throne in Jerusalem, reigning over Israel in the land and ruling over the nations of the world from that particular throne, God's promises weren't fulfilled. Uh, Reformed Presbyterian Christians pointed and said, Matthew 28, Jesus ascends to heaven and says, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Dispensationalists respond, yes, that's all good and well. But that's not, that's the not in David. Jerusalem. That's not in Jerusalem. That's not David's throne. He's Jesus is currently sitting down with his father in his throne, but he hasn't, that is God's throne, but he isn't he, he is not establishing his own throne, the throne of David. And until that happens, mm -hmm. and it's an earthly throne in a particular place geographically, um, the promises of the prophets about the great blessings that will come to the world can't happen. Now, because, and this, this is where this goes. Because this is so, the kingship that the prophets speak of with regard to Messiah is a political kingship. It is an unfulfilled kingship. Jesus is not yet this king. So Jesus may be Lord of us spiritually, but he's not king of anybody until he comes back. And thus the expression that's been common in evangelical circles, Jesus our prophet, priest, and coming king. Uh, and not, not everyone understands what that means. That mm. That's a dispensational expression that means he's not king yet. He will be king when he comes back. Uh, he can be lord I mean, of your life, but you he can, is... Go ahead. You can kind of still use that if you define it very carefully. <laughs> yeah. You know, because he, he, he does reign now, but Clearly, his his kingdom has not been finalized this is so. uh, on Earth. But if you're saying he doesn't rule on Earth at all, then <laughs> rather miss the forest for the trees. Yeah, um, you want to say, and our 
coming to victory king? I don't, uh, coming having conquered king? Uh, Paul is very clear that Jesus reigns until he has put all of his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to destroy his death. And he doesn't qualify that as he reigns until this, but then he switches thrones. And, and you have to ask, how does stepping down from all power in heaven and earth to an earthly throne, how exactly is that a promotion? Mm. How, how is that not a humiliation, a step backward for him? Uh, a lot, and, and what is tied into all of this, sort of tangentially, but, but perhaps more strongly than it is obvious, is the whole doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. If God has still has this thing he needs to do for Israel in the land with the throne of David, um, then God has two different plans. Uh, and Jesus plays the lead role in both of them, but one has to do with the salvation of the Gentiles with the preaching of the gospel in a spiritual kingdom, which Jesus rules from heaven, if you can call it a kingdom. I think today probably most neo-dispensationalists would, would give you that. I don't think they're still stuck in the 40s. But one time, one time that was the doctrine. Oh, uh, and, and then God has another plan for Israel that is tied up with returning to the land, rebuilding the temple, mm -hmm. reestablishing the throne of David, and basically the, the Mosaic slash Davidic economy so that the prophecies of the prophets can be fulfilled. Now, for that to happen then, and, and here's where it gets clever, if you turn to the more authoritative dispensational authors, whether it be the top theological authors or the pop theological authors, they've now gotten to the point where they generally admit something. They, there is no text for a pre-tribulation rapture. A, a rapture catching up the church, to be sure. Last judgment, sure. Tribulation at some point. Uh, but they will admit that there is not a specific text that you can point to that says, here's where the pre-tribulation rapture is. So they'll give you a list of about seven to 12 reasons that imply the need for pre-tribulation rapture. And at the top of the list is God has two different plans, one for the church and one for Israel. The only way that can be played out is to take the church out of the equation, to remove her from the world so that the other plan can run its, what, run its uh, intended route to the end. And so we, the dispensational system has always been very complicated. Everything, it is a system. Everything's tied to everything. There are numerous diagrams. <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there are. I've occasionally opened books of them. They don't, they don't do that much anymore. We need to be thankful for that. But there was a time when out of the, well, the 40s and 50s, there were just tons of diagrams. I remember seeing yes. one of the statue in Daniel 2, that looked pretty good until you got to the toes, and the toes were stretched over 2,000 years because the Roman Empire had to come back. So many things have to be revived in the dispensational system so they can literally take place. So we need a literal Israel in a literal land with a literal temple, a literal throne of David, with a literal Roman Empire to oppose it, and so on. It really does feel like every distinguishing aspect uh, of dispensationalism anyway is... <laughs> And I don't mean this in the sense that it sounds like, but it's very regressive in that it moves the clock backward mm -hmm. on a lot, not just yeah. on scriptural fulfillment, but also on uh, history itself. Yeah, history has to it's like back on itself. There's, you know, Rome has to come back somehow right. in order for this to come in, into being. Mm -hmm. And... It, it, to me, that just, it doesn't pass the smell test, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're approaching, all, that's just background to give maybe our listeners an idea of why this is important. Because what, what we're going to talk about, can, you can clearly establish from other parts of scripture without doubt. But I think it's important to understand that it doesn't just some, come out of nowhere in the New Testament, that it is very near the heart of the Old Testament. And that's this foreverness. Because here, here's the thing. People don't live forever. All men die. One of my favorite lines from the first Star Trek. All men die. Yes, all men die. I mean, I won't go there. But we do. So how can you have an eternal kingdom and an eternal king if everyone's dying? What, what, who is the seed of David? Who is the son of David? Who is this Messiah that he should be beyond death? 
uh, that raises some serious questions. You, you can say, well, God is the great king. Yeah, but he's God in his own nature is not human. And so no surprise he can't die. But he also can't do a lot of other things that are rather needful here. Well, he's just this really great human being like David. David had his measure of sins. And that doesn't seem like, and David died. Samuel, um, or First Kings rather, tells us uh, how David got decrepit and old and feeble and couldn't get warm and he died. It's just yeah. fur further and further reconfirmation that even King David yeah. is beset by the curse. Yeah. So who, and of course, the great mysteries uh, of the Old Testament is who is this person? Uh, how how can he be all he, he would need to be? And what exactly is he going to do to pull this off? How we, can we, he be David's <laughs> son, yes. yet David's Lord? Yeah, David's Lord. Which is the question, of course, Jesus raised to the uh, the Pharisees. And they had no answer. Because they assumed, well, we just need a great conqueror like Caesar, except it's got to be Jewish. And that'll fix everything. As long as you know the guy who is is out conquering and pillaging is one of us, it, it'll it'll work out fine. It, it, yeah, that, that that that'll fix everything. And they had never reckoned with the foreverness, the non-death, the immortality that's implied here. And it, and it can't simply be that the king is immortal, although he must be for this to work. He must reign forever, but. If his people are not also immortal, he's got a really shabby kingdom, and it's going to get real that, lonely. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking of when you were talking about this earlier, is that what good is having an immortal king if his people are not also living forever? Yeah. I think one of the things that like you see a lot in, in the medieval period and, and uh, even the, the periods uh, directly before it is that kings are somewhat judged according to the quality of their kingdom. Mm -hmm. And if your kingdom's in disrepair, then what kind of a king are you? Right. And so if right. your kingdom is consistently dying every new generation, then what kind of immortal kingdom are you? Yeah. And, and your point about uh, medieval thought forms is, is excellent um, and tracks through the mythologies and the legends, the Arthurian legend, for instance. The king is married to the people in the land. If the king fails, the land and the people suffer. And the king is doing what he's supposed to do, then justice and peace and prosperity should prevail throughout the land. That's, that's an echo of biblical thought forms. And as you read the Old Testament, and particularly the prophets, it comes out really clear. The measure of the king is not simply that we got to have this great king and, and then die one by one and he lives on forever. That's just not it. But well, somehow... Also, too, like... I'm sorry to keep interrupting. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> something you said at the at the start of this really started my brain working on on this concept, which is, you know, for for the Old Testament, for the for the uh, citizen of national Israel, mm -hmm. one of the things that brought you and your house glory was to have many children so that mm -hmm. they could lay claim to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And so, the more kids you had, you know, the more kids they could have, and the more land would be you know brought under your family name your name would echo down through the generations mm -hmm. and so for david to be told your son is going to sit on your throne forever and reign over the house of jacob forever is to essentially say your name is going to continue forever mm -hmm. and so yeah, absolutely what i think and we've you know we've already mentioned our issues with dispensationalism but one of the issues that dispensationalism takes is that regressive quality where if Jesus is David's son and David's Lord at the same time, and he is reigning forever, and he's reigning over everything, heaven and earth and the promised land included, mm -hmm. then it really is a step backwards for him to relinquish any of that at all and to ignore the fulfillment of the messianic prophe uh, prophecies about its culmination in the whole world. Like we mentioned last week, we, we, we talked about how the Davidic covenant was, was something that recognized the at least eventual inbringing, in enfolding of the Gentiles into the covenant of grace, uh, into uh, the covenant with God. And for somebody to basically say, well, that's kind of happening now 
but it's going to go back to the way it was after all the Gentiles and, and the believers have been taken away to heaven is missing the plot it, <laughs> quite literally because literally, yeah, the Bible yeah. is a story. And if we're looking at it that way, it, it it's no greater glory. Uh, it's not a greater glory. That is for you to lose a, a good chunk of your kingdom and call that victory. And, and there's something, I, I, thank you, because that, that brings something to my mind in terms of all of this. The, the question becomes, so why would this change take place? And there are only two answers, because as you say, God gave up and called it a day and went on to something else that was as good or bad or, you know, didn't go anywhere. Or uh, he actually expects to do better with a purely political kingdom backed by purely divine political and divine power. So the, in other words, the gospel kind of failed. Oof. Yeah, there were there were these ideas of bringing in all the nations, go make disciples of all nations and all that. But um, yeah, it didn't really work. So if we put Jesus on earth, um, one of the, another dispensational slogan is no king, no kingdom without a king. So well, if we put him here on earth where he can see what's going on and exercise his divine power directly and compel people to obey, then he will subdue the whole earth to righteousness because people will obey or else. Now, there's been one or two writers in the last few decades who have said, yeah, see, that's not even the kingdom of God. All that is is proof that there is no kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will not come. Uh, right. all, all we've got is eternity, because even Jesus personally reigning on earth is not going to change people's hearts, change the world's hearts. The, the world is, is a lost cause. So yeah. it's it, it was nice that God loved it and tried to save it, but it's basically God's going to fail no matter how he tries. And all of this is just proof that we are incorrigible, unredeemable, unsavable, and God will save a few people as he can, but he will most certainly keep his promises which are purely outward promises for the most part, because political power and, and, and miracles, uh, striking at people with lightning bolts from Jerusalem, isn't going to save anybody. Although we yeah. can establish order for a little while. Well, what's interesting too, is that when you talk with, not all dispensationalists, oh. but- um, And there are different flavors of dispensationalism. There are, and there's about are, as many different flavors yeah. of dispensationalism as there are dispensationalists. Yeah, um, and, and, and the, the newer brand are are far more sensitive to the continuity of the two covenants, but they still are kind of hung up on this Jewish Gentile thing, because um, I think many of them have not thought through it. You know, they, re they respect their teachers, they respect the books they had to read in seminary, they respect their denominations, their, their institutions, as we all do. Yeah, but and so we're not being vicious here or mean spirited. No, we're trying to say you, you guys, you got a problem. You really should think about this a little bit more. But yeah, because um, uh, some of the the crazier ones, and I don't mind calling these ones crazy because yeah, there there are some that they're yeah, folks are. like you know a John Hagee. Mm. He's really the only one I'm thinking of at this moment. <laughs> um, but you were specifically to a good because deal, I suspect. Yeah, yes. he he definitely does. I mean, the books that he's published on mm -hmm. on supposed biblical prophecy and blood moons and whatnot. Um, but he he said something once uh, about how the <clears throat> the reason that we even have the church now is because Jesus uh, did not come to Earth in his earthly ministry or in his resurrection as the messiah and he's going to do that later he's going to do that for the nation of israel in the future mm. and i feel like there's a softer version of that in the more uh, i should say not the more the less crazy dispensationalists mm -hmm. uh which is to say that the church exists because the jewish people rejected christ as messiah and now he's kind of moved on and and moved on with the church instead for now because his people actually rejected him without recognizing that that completely undercuts the foundation of Romans of Galatians of scripture in general <laughs> Hebrews yeah yeah, yeah. It's, um, and I appreciate them trying to make the gospel central to all that God's doing I just don't think they're managing it. I right. Yeah. It's a, a fixation on Israel returning to the land and a rebuilt temple. 
you, you, you can't have the gospel central. It's just those are it's contradictory things, as Hebrews tells us. A little us. clumsy. Yeah. Like what they're what they're trying to do is essentially, well, we really think that this new way of looking at things is the right way. And you know, the best of them actually try to base it on things that show up in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Um and then the irony too, of course, is that they're sticking very hard to this brand new tradition. I mean, it, it is brand new. Mm-hmm. Um and then also calling people who disagree with them, you know, traditionalists. And <laughs> it's kind of like there's a there's a, th- a thing where it's like how to be a dispensationalist. And this is, you know, not – this is not a charitable towards dispensationalist thing. So uh, I don't don't think I affirm this wholeheartedly. But it's, it's how, to be, how to be a dispensationalist. Step one, replace the long-held view of, of God's people that has been held by the church throughout most of church history. Call the other side replacement theologians and fail to see the irony. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. I mean, yeah, it's it's new. It's an it's a new thing. It's novel. It mm-hmm. came into being in a very specific period of history, which produced a lot of other movements that were similar to mm-hmm. it in uh, in its not essence, but in its um, accidents, mm-hmm. if you will, yeah. and. If you're going to hold to it consistently, you also have to say that every spirit-filled teacher in the church for 1,800 years before this came into being was being actively and successfully misled by you know, Satan. Who else would do that? And what some people may not realize is that the best church historians among the dispensationalists do freely admit that this is a new perspective. Not new in the sense that it wasn't in the Bible, but new in the sense that it was lost almost immediately after the Apostles' yeah. death and was not revived until the mid-1800s. They, they admit that, the, that for 1,800 years or more, the church had forgotten this and that uh, at a particular time and place, it was rekindled. And, and now and they would argue it's in Scripture. It always was. But yeah, the church, the church completely missed this. That's... Yeah. Um, not something I would want to say about much of anything. And no. it's strange that they are comfortable saying that. Uh, but it, that was the, it was a, funny. The the age you're describing was an age of contradictions. On the one hand, it was the rise of irrationalism, romanticism, spiritualism, the whole mass of cults you talked about. On the other hand, it was an age of German rationalism as well where everything was brought to the bar of reason, including and especially scripture. And we began throwing out anything that didn't meet its demands. Oh, we found new manuscripts. Therefore, all the old manuscripts that we've used for 1800 years go out the window because this is more rational. Well, on the other side is saying, well, here's a tradition that is not a tradition. We're going to make a one because we should have seen it. We didn't for 1800 years. There's a lot of trying to go back to the fountain without good and sufficient cause and in the process, just ignoring God's providence and sovereignty. Now, yeah. God, let these things get lost. He may thank us now that we've restored them. It's, 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 it's dangerous ground to walk on. Yeah. Well, moving on, I want to, I, there are two other passages I want to read. One mostly I just want to read because as I said, Second Samuel doesn't address or doesn't make use of the word covenant, but Psalm 89, which is written sometime later, does it's looking back it's a time when judah is in great tribulation and uh great distress and the appeal is to god's covenant with david and this is what it says this is psalm 89 beginning with verse 18. for the lord is our defense and the holy one of israel is our king then thou spakest in vision to thy holy one and said i have laid help upon one that is mighty i have exalted one chosen out of the people i found david my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the seas, in his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. 
Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep forever and forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I'll visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. And then the psalmist goes off to try to contrast those great promises with the distress they're going through at the moment. And, and like so many believers, if Jesus is king, if God's covenant is good, why are we in this mess? And of course, that's also a familiar dispensational argument. Uh, well, if Jesus is king, then where's his kingdom? Right. <laughs> I've encountered that before. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned, um, or quoted, um, from Luke 1, uh, Gabriel's Annunciation. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So we, we're getting clarity, promises to David, but it goes beyond David to his seed, and seems to include sons who will not be all that obedient all the time, but it keeps going and going and seems to aim beyond that. As we come to Gabriel here, it seems pretty clear. Yeah, all that, all that was about this. This is the one. This is the one who will reign forever. Uh, it, it's the, the, the sons of David or adopted kings who had a special relationship of one sort or another with God. Some he chastened, some he blessed. Uh, and then the kingdom was lost during the captivity, it hasn't been restored. But now the one, the one who will reign forever has come. He's in your womb, or he's about to be in your womb, Mary. And he's going to reign forever. And so we're still left with it. Okay, what, what, what does that look like? And how does this work? And now I'd like to go to Acts chapter 2. Because this is one of the texts that uh, Peter uses on the day of Pentecost to explain to Israel exactly what's going on. It starts with, of course, the descent of the Spirit, the 120 disciples speaking in other languages, everyone hears them, and um, some are mocking, saying they're they're drunk, and Peter says, no, it's too early in the morning, good Jews don't get drunk this early. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out upon my, of my Spirit upon all flesh. And he goes through the prophecy in some detail, but I'll skip over that. This shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So those two things, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, not just Israel. And whoever, not just Israel, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what you're seeing is the outpouring of the spirit that the prophet spoke of, Joel being one of them. And wrapped up in that is God reaching out to the whole world, Gentiles as well as Jews, with his offer of salvation. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're here. It's happening. And but of course, and any good Jew would understand this, the fact that Messiah, or the fact that the Spirit has been poured out means Messiah has come. And so everyone's gonna be looking around, what way that you're you're saying Messiah's come. Who, where? What did we miss him? Um, kind of. You murdered him. And so Peter awkward. goes, Yeah, awkward. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. By miracles and wonders and signs, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by, by wicked hands of crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holy of it. Okay, so now we're falling back on the ideas. We're, 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 we're seeing the Davidic covenant here. He died. He really, really died. But God raised him up because it was not possible for death to hold him. And the question has to be, what do you mean it's not possible? All men die. He's a man. He died. He died prematurely, was murdered. We get that, but he's dead. And yes, God, we know that God has raised people up from the dead before, but they died again. So why, why are you saying it's impossible for death to hold on to this Jesus? What's, what's going on here? And 
Peter continues by quoting from another psalm. For David speaketh concerning him. I force, this is Psalm uh, 16, he's quoting. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's in my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Sheol, the grave, the realm of the dead. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. His body will not begin to degenerate. So he's going to die, but he's not going to be dead very long, and he's going to get better. Uh, thou hast made known to me the way of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Well, David said, said that, but you know what? David's still dead. And that's where Peter, that's where Peter goes. Men and brethren, let me freely, freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. So does Scripture have the mistake? No, no. David's a prophet, and prophets, like poets, and writers in general, can speak for someone else. They can become the voice of someone else. Here, David is speaking as the Messiah, as his greater son. He says this, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing, and it's not just that the Holy Ghost overwhelmed him, put words in his mouth that came blurting out. There is a rational process here in David. David knows that God has sworn with an oath, makes it a covenant, to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, the Messiah, to sit on his throne. Okay, so David knew this. He, he, he took what God had sworn as being a covenant oath, and he was at, so it was absolutely sure that of the fruit of his loins, that of his own genetic material, God was going to raise up the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, to sit on his throne. There's the throne of David. Well, okay, well, what is this and how is this? David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So when David rationally contemplated this promise and meditated on it and thought through it as to what it would mean, he came to the conclusion, which he expressed in this psalm, that his greater son, this Messiah, this son of David, would not be held by death. He would die, but he would come back to life in such a way that he would sit on the throne of David and so fulfill the scripture that the Messiah will reign forever. He will taste of death, and yet he'll beat death. He will beat death by tasting death, and he will come back with some kind of resurrection life that's not like anything the world had ever seen. This Jesus hath God raised up. Wherefore, we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, he's quoting Psalm 110, which you mentioned earlier, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, so he fulfilled what the Father had of him, and now he's ascended to heaven. He's at the Father's right hand, so the throne of David must be the throne at the Father's right hand. He's poured out the Holy Spirit. For David's not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know that the same Jesus whom you've crucified is both Lord and Christ. So there's Peter's Ooh. interpretation of the throne of David. Why was it impossible for death to hold him? Because uh, he's righteous and he's God. He's going to submit to death. And, and the implication that Peter does not work out here, but Paul works out in Romans, is that because he is righteous, death will not hold him. He comes back to life, having satisfied for our sins, having none of his own to worry about. And therefore, he has a righteousness which he can give to us by outpouring his spirit and bringing us to faith and then sanctifying us and working grace in us. And so when the people say, what should we do? Repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Remember, this is where this started. What's going on? This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How do I get it? Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, and you'll be forgiven, justified by faith. You'll receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the promises to you and your children, all that are afar off, there's the whole world again, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so what Peter's pulling together here are what our dispensationalist friends have tried to divide. The kingdom of David that lasts forever with Jesus at the Father's right hand saving the world. These are not two different things. Mm. This is the same thing. This is the plan. 
this is the way. Um, exactly. And, yeah. and something that I was thinking of <clears throat> during this is that if you take the dispensationalist scheme, uh, meaning they're not not that their plot, but uh, you know <laughs> yeah. their schema, if you yeah. will. Um, you have here Peter explicitly drawing our attention to the throne that Christ is currently sitting on and the throne of David. They are one of the same. And the same thing. And if uh, the son of David is going to reign forever, there is not a gap. Yeah. There's no there's no gap here. Christ has ascended into heaven, and he is reigning now. He he sits on the throne of David. And if you think that he's not sitting on the throne of David, for one, Peter is is directly contradicting that. And for the, the second point, you're unable to say that Christ is reigning forever because you've yeah. introduced a stop in the middle. Right at the start, he 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 goes up, and he sits down, and then he apparently stands up again. And goes well, actually, hang on, uh, we gotta we gotta do some other stuff first, and then we'll get back to the real thing. Yeah, and it does leave a question as to what exactly happens in the dispensational scheme at the end of the millennium. Jesus comes and sits on the throne of David for a thousand years, and then goes where? And then goes where? Does he continue on the throne of David? Or does he ascend to heaven again? Or are the some the two merge? Whatever it happens, you're not going to find an explicit biblical text that says tells you because there isn't yeah. one. Because you, you, you're already out wandering in the darkness and just making up things as you go, and it really is a problem. What is the nature of Jesus' reign? What is the nature of a, of of this eternal life he has in himself? Here, here's the um, syllogism, I suppose. Well, it's not exactly syllogism. Death is the penalty for sin. If you want to beat death, you have to beat sin. If someone has beat death, it's because he has beat sin. That is, he has atoned for it. He has he is a propitiation against God's wrath. He's reconciled sinners to God. He has done that which is necessary to ensure eternal life for his people, which is going to mean dying in their place. So to have an eternal kingdom, you have to it has to be have its foundation in shed blood. Yes. In atoning blood, in death, in the cross. In sin being slain. And sl slaying sin by the Messiah's own death. And then he has to get over that. He has to come back to life. Or he got better. He get better. You can get, or you don't have a reigning king. But having gotten better, having come back to life uh, with a glory beyond what he manifested before then, and with the gift of the Spirit to pour out, now he can grant eternal life not just to a remnant in Israel, but to the whole world. And that's been the focus. He will reign forever, and he will reign over the whole world. And that's what this psalm, or this uh, passage in Acts is about. Pour out the Spirit upon all flesh. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The promise is to you and to your children, to all that are far off. Because Jesus is reigning in resurrection life, and he has the Spirit, the Sovereign Spirit, who can give people life, and he's not going to fail. He's not limited to external coercion. He's not limited to political power and armies. He can do what no other king has ever been able to do. He can reach out and touch your heart and make you a new person. And it's with and that's the kind of confidence we need yeah. if we're going to go preach the gospel. Because anything else is going to degenerate into manipulation real fast. How can we get you to walk down the aisle and raise your hand? Um, and when if we've tried that for a few generations, we give up and say, well, you know, it just didn't work, did it? It's in the light of this that David writes some of his more triumphant psalms. And I, I'm just going to read from a few of them, because to read all of them would take way too long. But I, I, I think this is a good place to, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be fast, to integrate the Psalter. I will declare the decree, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 22, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he's the governor among the nations. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him, Psalm 72. 
the kings of Tarshish, the Asher, bring presents, the kings of Seba and Sheba shall offer gifts. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make all thine enemies thy footstool. Thy people will be willing in the day of thy power. So there's, there's the great promise of the gospel. Mm. It's what God promised Abraham in thee, all nations blessed. So we get to the, end on a positive note. Yes. <laughs> we don't always manage. The good news the good of news. the gospel yeah. is the victory over sin. And it isn't limited to just your sin has been expunged mm -hmm. and you have a clean slate. It is also you are united to Christ. Mm -hmm. You are brought into his kingdom as a citizen. And if that kingdom isn't in substance now, then we're sort of left in a weird limbo. Mm -hmm. We exactly. need the kingdom to be now. Yeah. If we're going to have hope, it's our evidence, one of our many pieces of evidence, that God has, in fact, defeated sin. Indeed. Indeed. So with that, let's move on to recommendations. I actually have two uh, that I would love to – you know what? I'm just going to say all three because the odds of me all remembering right. the third one by next week uh, or the next recording session is low. So um, <laughs> I have – a food item tool recommendation slash just appreciation. And that is uh, we recently purchased a new pressure cooker, mm. which has been phenomenal. We, we cook a whole chicken in it one day. We mm -hmm. shred the chicken from the chicken, the chicken meat from the chicken. And um, then we take those bones and we take, you know, ends of vegetables and stuff and water and we make stock from that mm, which then mm. we use in a different soup recipe that we also make in the instant pot <laughs> thing has been used just about every day since we got it <laughs> really good like it's really great for curries and stew uh we made we've been making a lot of lentil things because lentils mm. are like in vogue but um they're also very good and good for you uh so instant pot is the first one uh, next is uh, when we were talking about the Davidic covenant and what, what God tells to David, you mentioned that it, just about everything is used here from older covenant establishment ceremonies, if you mm -hmm. want to call them ceremonies, uh, except for the word covenant. Uh, recently, I've been looking more into uh, the bifurcation of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace mm -hmm. and you know federal headship under adam and federal headship under christ and one of the things that opponents of this view the, that there is a covenant of works which for people who are not aware listening uh is the idea that when god created adam and eve he gave to them a command and if they had followed through on the command, it would have been meritorious for them. Their works would have been considered a good work on their own merit. And obviously, Adam and Eve, and Adam specifically as the federal head, failed that and doomed the human race to misery and sin. But one of the things people say against this idea is that, well, when God creates Adam and gives him the command, he never uses the word covenant. So we can't call it a covenant. <laughs> And I, I feel like this um, this particular passage from uh, from David's life is an excellent rebuttal because everyone recognizes that this is a covenant with David, and the word yeah. covenant never shows up there in that particular yeah. passage. Not in that passage; it does show up in in the Psalms, but it's a later psalmist that uses it. So, yeah, it, it, this is a thing. The, 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 I have been frustrated within the last week by certain persons who are beloved brothers in Christ, but who use similar arguments in certain other related areas that basically say, if the word's not there, it doesn't count. And even if the word is there, it doesn't count because God's not bound to using the same word the same way all the time, which is technically true, but you're, the burden of proof is on you to show that God changed his, his usage. Especially when the usage of the term covenant is very consistent throughout Scripture. Well, and see, that's the thing. These, and the word actually is covenant that they're, they're bickering about. Because they say, yeah, throughout the whole Old Testament, it meant one thing, more or less. But then when we get a new covenant, well, it's brand new. 
And so God can change it radically. It doesn't have to be like all the old covenants because they're old. And it's a, a nice way to kind of halt covenant theology, stick, keep it in the Old Testament and not let it get into the new, because I think they, they, they have a sneaking suspicion. Well, they know what's going to happen if they let it in. They're just convinced that that's somehow heretical and you shouldn't do that. Yeah. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, my, no, my recommendation is just to reaffirm the necessity mm -hmm. of a view that includes the covenant of works. It is mm -hmm. actually quite foundational to yeah. the reformed confessions, to being reformed. Yeah. Um, and I will, obviously, I will. as a reformed person, I would say that means it's a, an integral part of being scriptural, but go on. Yeah. I will, I will tweak your definition just a little bit because I, I'm very familiar with the attacks on that doctrine. Yeah. And just to kind of forestall it, when we say meritorious, we mean God said, if you do this, I will do this. That's the nature of the merit. We, God didn't owe us anything. God gave us something. God graciously, mercifully gave us out of his overflowing, abundant love and goodness, gave us something with an instruction manual that basically said, and don't push this button. And all we had to do was not push the button. In that sense, we God promised us something. And if we do what he said, then the merit is, it, it's not, it's not a, a, a natural merit, like we gave something to God he needed. But it is the fulfilling of what God has told us, something that is good and happy for us, that should have made sense, that should have been perfectly good. But yes, our eternal destiny is conditioned upon doing or not doing that. Yeah, and 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 that's the point. So if people want to argue over the word merit. Well, let's let's define our terms. I think I'm sure we can come up with a definition that'll suit you. Yeah. But what bothers me far more is when they move to Jesus and say, "Yeah, and Jesus didn't merit anything either." Okay, no, he's God. He is intrinsically meritorious. The Father mm -hmm. loves him infinitely. Yep. Uh, that's not up for that's not up for argument. He, no, he, no, no, it's not. Is, yeah. Yeah, in him dwells all the fullness of the God had bodily God looks at him and is well pleased. God does consider him good, not a neutral quality that we can work with somehow. He mm -hmm. over overwhelmingly rejoices in his son. And so with regard to what he did for us, it is absolutely we absolutely must affirm the merits of Christ. Yes. Infinite and, goodness. Infinite goodness. Uh so anyway, I'm I'm affirming the covenant of works, particularly because uh I I'm under I'm under the impression that the covenant of works and covenant of grace um, dichotomy is sort of the reformed grammar of the law gospel distinction, which mm -hmm. is more well known as a Lutheran distinctive, yeah. but um, or at least falsely stated to be a Lutheran uh, exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, <laughs> it it is it is also in the Reformed Confessions. And finally, the the recommendation that is relevant to part of our discussion today is uh, Vern Poythress's excellent book called Understanding Dispensationalists. Oh yes, 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 yes. which I need to reread forty seven times because <laughs> I get very confused. And I grew up dispensational, yeah. so it's it's a very you know, confusing. Growing up dispensational doesn't mean you understand it. No, my, no, it does not. <laughs> my experience with with young dispensationalists is that they're full of questions. Like, so is this the rapture? Okay, where do the killer bees come in? Where, <laughs> where in the is this the tribul is this before or after the tribulation? What about the attack helicopters? Yeah, um, and and there's they they've been exposed to the sensationalism of it all. Oh yeah, but no one, and unfortunately, I, I think even when people have tried to diagram it for them, that doesn't help. No, no, it doesn't because <laughs> it just, it's so there's 47 totally different, you know, yeah. uh, uh, items in the key to understand yeah. the chart, and yeah. it's sort of it's sort of like looking at uh, an IFB uh, chart of you know church history and denominational history and how it <laughs> finally gets down to them and we're the right ones, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yes, yes. Uh, in that, along those lines, I will recommend two older books, since you've got a more recent one. Uh, they are both about covenant, but they both touch on eschatology, biblical prophecy as well. Uh, an older, well, they're both actually, I don't have the original publication date for one. One is called Israel and the New Covenant. It's by a layman named, a Canadian layman named Roderick Campbell. Roderick Campbell, Israel and the New Covenant. So it was published at one point by, by uh, Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company. It's been published by other people since. 
it is a good introduction to biblical theology. Um, I, I, I think it is a little lacking in, in getting down to brass tacks and specifics at points, but it does address general concepts, general ideas about how to interpret scripture and covenant language and biblical imagery and typology. Uh, and I think we'll clear a lot of ground for people who are interested. The second book is O. Palmer Robinson's wonderful book, Christ of the Covenants, yes. which is more scholarly and more concrete in its language and deals with, with the, the mechanics of the covenants and how they interrelate relate with one another. And I think to understand eschatology, you have to understand the covenant. I mean, you can understand Jesus wins. Okay, good. But if you want to understand how that is integrated with the rest of Scripture, a good understanding of the covenant, I think, is essential. And this is, yeah. at this point, probably the best introduction to covenant theology there is. There are some older books, but I think this is recent enough that it, deal, it deals explicitly with dispensationalism. It deals with some of the things that people were saying, well, at least 20 years ago. You know, there's right. a constant change of vocabulary and issues, but... Uh, if, if you want to get serious about understanding Reformed theology, and particularly Reformed reformed understanding prophecy, this is a good place to start. He, he's not going to tell you when the killer bees show up, but he will tell you about what the covenant with David was all about and how the new covenant wraps everything together and is the perfection of fulfillment and all that we need is Jesus. And oh, I so love he it. preaches the gospel. Yeah, that book has been on my shelf for I don't know how many years, and I, I think I started it at one point and got distracted by something going on in my life. Mm -hmm. But um, I have I have heard at least a dozen different people that I'm loosely connected to recommend it and speak very highly of it. So uh, based on that secondhand knowledge, I can also recommend that. And we have a visitor, I think. Is she still Hello. there? Oh, uh, well, no. unfortunately for the rest of you, you did not get to see when Gretchen came and went, but <laughs> she was here briefly and we smiled at her. She, smiled she was there at for us. a moment. And uh, Emily, do you want to say anything? Or are you even hooked up? No, she's, she's not. not. That's okay. <laughs> so she's smiling at you all and is basking in the joys, waving, basking in the joys of motherhood and recovery. <laughs> so good to see you, Emily. Good to see you. All right. Well, Thank you so much for this discussion. I think we'll wrap that up. Uh, thank you to our listeners for joining us. Uh, if you would like to follow us, you can do so at youtube.com on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page, which is not super active at the moment. <laughs> um, and also, if you want to subscribe to us, you can do so through any of the podcast catchers that are out there. If you'd like to email us, uh, you can do so at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. If you have book recommendations for us, you can share those. Uh, we would love that. Um, podcasts, things, just don't always make it angry emails. I know I make that as a joke, but, you know, we'd, we'd like to hear other things from you. Uh, you can also support us at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. We are very, very thankful to our financial supporters who help us keep subscriptions to editing software up and running and uh, help alleviate some of that burden for us and help us get these things out to you quicker. Also, thanks to David Maxson, who is Emily Maxson's lawfully wedded husband, and <laughs> all his editing work and fine tuning things. In any case, we will see you next time.